Hello and welcome, I'm Maria from Sew Through Time, and this time we're making a historical Disney Cinderella cosplay from 1860. I've been wanting to make an 1860s or a late 50s gown for quite some time, and now that I've made my cage crinoline, I decided it was definitely time to make that dream come true. And I started looking at different gowns, extant gowns and fashion plates, for inspiration. And I f really loved this kind of, it comes out in the very late 50s into style and then it goes throughout the early 60s. This style of wear of having these underskirts showing from underneath and the skirt being hiked up. There's a lot with bows and then there's some with where it, it's some sort of ribbon. And there's actually, I found even a pattern for making this ribbon li skirt lifting contraption. And then I found from the Met, this amazing dress from 1860. It is white silk. I think it's a silk taffeta. And then it has some fur trimmings and then these silk baubles on it. And I just completely fell in love with this gown and I just had to make this. But I didn't want it all white, even though I did actually have some white taffeta in my stash, but it just, it felt a little too youthful and I didn't want an exact copy of the gown. So instead I decided to make mine out of a pink cotton velvet that I had in my stash. When I started making this gown, I hadn't actually thought of making it into a Cinderella cosplay. My idea originally was just that I want to make this Met Met gown and just make it pink. And I knew I wanted the trimmings white and I knew I wanted to add that hem detail. Not only because I thought it looked good and because it would add a little interest to the hem, but also because I had only a little over five yards of this cotton velvet, so I knew it wouldn't be enough for the full length gown. But as I was working on this bodice and I got to the trimming part where I was stitching on that white trim, I just realized that this was like Cinderella's gown that the mice make her from her mother's dress. And that actually fit really well because the cage crinoline it makes the circumference of the skirt much bigger, but it also shortens the hem. So this would be actually a way that somebody might have remade a gown from say the 1840s that would have a narrower hem so that it couldn't reach all the way to the bottom of the cage. And it also, it, it would lift up so that it wouldn't cover the cage anymore anyways. So then you could add a colored petticoat underneath and then just hike it up with bows to make it look as if that was meant originally for the gown. So I really liked the idea of combining this Cinderella dress with this historical gown. Wasted my mock up since I was visiting relatives and didn't have my sewing machine with me. I don't have footage of the first fitting because I was again at the said relative's house, but I tried it on and pinned it on my body the way it needed to be, and then used a pencil to draw out the changes I needed for the pattern onto the fabric, and then I used the fabric to trace the changes onto my pattern. 
the back piece needed only minor alterations, but the side piece and the front piece needed major alterations, even in the direction of the actual fabric. But hey, this is what mock-ups are for, so that's why don't skip this step. Okay, and the second fit is a success. This one fits me fairly well. I do need to add about an inch to the front piece. And then this weirdness will be mostly padding out this hollow bit here. And then there's a little something still that I need to fiddle around with the shoulder line, the upper edge but that I'll fiddle with the finished garment because that's not anything I need to account for in the pattern. The bodice is flat lined, meaning that I sew the lining and the fashion fabric together. At the center back, the seam allowances are turned in between the lining and the fashion fabric, and then the seam is felled together. I'm just using the zip tie that I will bone the edge with as kind of my guide. I'm not cutting it yet so that I can get the all inserted in the right place and get the hole in the right place because I did not see any kind of stitching as far as I could tell on the bodices that I looked so the bone just gets kind of held in place by the all puncture and then of course the top and bottom seams so that's what I'm gonna do Okay, looking at my reference picture, it looks like it's spiral lacing and I'd say an inch and a half apart because inch looks too tight and two inches is just way too far apart. So we're going with an inch and a half.
I make piping for edging the bodice using a thick coarse wool yarn and some white velvet. I fold in the bottom seam allowance and sew on the piping. I cut open the dart so that the seam can lay flat when I lay the piping over it. Then I whip down the seam allowance of both my piping and my fashion fabric and lining in one, making sure my stitching goes only through my lining and not my fashion fabric. I sew piping onto the neckline as well. I notch the seam allowance around my neck so that it can lay flat underneath the piping. And then I whip down the seam allowance the same way as I did on the bottom. So the only velvet that I could find that has that similar fur kind of look and shine to it, that, that trim in the original had, well, this is a tad bit more shiny, but close to it, was unfortunately this knit back velvet. So we're gonna have to improvise a little bit to get this to work. To make those bands for trimming the bodice, I start by sewing a cotton tape to the upper edge of my fabric to give me stability to work with. And then I fold over once to hide the tape and a second time to make the proper width for the trim. And then sew along the top edge to secure the trim. And then I cut it right along the edge of that fold. Then I pin on the first row of trimming, trying to match my reference picture. Then I sew it on at the center back and at the upper edge. Excuse the fact that I'm just out of the shower and this whole thing, but I had to show you. Apparently, I'm an idiot. I, the back of this trim, I, put it on both sides neatly, and I made sure that the edges were the same way on my shoulder, and that the fronts were the same way. And here in the back, I made sure that they were both on the second eyelet, below the second eyelet, so that they would be evenly. But the problem is that this does not have even lacing. It has spiral lacing. I made it spiral lacing. So, the backs are like this. I 
I feel so dumb right now. And then the second row of trim, this time without any silly mistakes. Okay, I really fell in love with these dangling crocheted baubles that were in that extant gown. So this is how I make them. I'm using a silk yarn that I had. And I make a magic loop. So basically just make a loop, hold the working end of the yarn away from your body. Then you go through the loop with your crochet hook, pick that up and pull it so that you hold it with your fingers so that it kind of creates a loop. And grab your working yarn and pull it through the loop to make a stitch. Now, you grab your with your hook underneath the magic loop and grab your working yarn. Oh, I'm stuck. There. And pull it to the same side with you. And then you grab a loop and basically make a single crochet out of that. So that's your second stitch. Then you continue this for your third stitch, your fourth stitch, and your fifth stitch. Then you pull on the end of the loop, pull it tight, and it closes the gap. It makes it round. And now, basically you're supposed to take both loops of the first stitch, but because that's a little difficult, I just use one for the first stitch. And single crochet twice into that. Then you grab the next stitches. And try to get both loops in there and single crochet twice into that. And the same goes for the next one and the next one. Now we start the second round, and again the same thing, we single crochet into the loops twice. It's a little hard to see because you make it so round. Okay, and now since we have a decent sized loop here, and now we start making a single crochet into each one of these stitches. So not double, only one. As you can see, it starts to form a little cup. But we 
we continue this? I get lost to track of rounds, so I just kind of eyeball it. But if you're better at crocheting, you might be able to keep up with rounds and be able to be more consistent with it. I'm not a crocheter. I'm a knitter and a sewist, but I can crochet, like, enough to make this. So I just eyeball it. I think that's been one of the biggest lessons I've learned with historical costuming is that you don't have to be afraid of not being like good at some craft or being an expert in some craft. You can still make pretty things and incorporate them into your gowns and get pretty results. And it doesn't really matter if the technique is perfect as long as the end result is perfect. Uh, is what you wanted it to be because in history they really didn't care there's a lot of things that like sewists in the bat bat past would not care like even high-end garments will have things that aren't exactly even aren't exactly perfect because as long as it looks good they didn't care still a bit more. I want to get to, because I think it's cupping up a little bit more here than it is here, so I want to get to about there. And we'll pretend that that's where the round ends, because we have no clue. And now we start building the top part. So what we do is we insert our needle and pull it. Hoop. Hook. It's not a needle, it's a hook. And, but instead of single crocheting this now, we do that again. We insert our hook into the next one, pull the thread through, and now here you have three loops on your hook. And you pull kind of like a single crochet through all the loops. And we do that again. And then you continue working like this until it looks like it's fair, it's closed and forms a bobble like this. Now one more and it will be closed. through and there we have it our ready bobble I made the total of 34 bobbles for this game are inserted between the bubbles on the bottom row.
for the sleeves, I used the magic sleeve technique where you layer the fabric and the lining right sides on the inside and then stitch them together. And then flip it so that the fashion fabric is on top and the lining inside and all the seam allowances are in between the two fabrics. So it's neatly finished in one stitch. stitch the sleeve on by hand. Then the bottom edge of the sleeve is bound with a wide band of the velvet. The skirt is made out of the same pink cotton velvet as the bodice. It is made two inches longer in the back to accommodate the shape of the hoop. And the length is cut so that it is 10 inches off the ground finished, so that the petticoat's white velvet ruffle shows. I mark the length for my cartridge plating around the back and on the front sides. For the center, I sew down three large box pleats. The cartridge pleats are sewn onto the waistband using a buttonhole twist silk for extra strength. And here it is, my finished Cinderella gown from 1960. The bodice fit could be better, I have some wrinkling at the waist, and that is due to the fact that I had to switch corsets halfway through this project because my body just wasn't having the other one. Bodies fluctuate, and that's sometimes things that happen. And because this corset has a much higher hip spring than the other one, it causes some wrinkling at the bodice waist. That's something that I might go in and fix later, but right now I really don't care. I hope you enjoyed this video and if you did please give it a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already so that I can see you again next time. Bye!